Welcome to the AP Calculus AB video for skill number 127. I can apply the intermediate value theorem to continuous functions. And the trivia question for this video is the term column is used how mathematically? All right, we'll start our notes on page 127a and we're going to learn about the intermediate value theorem. The intermediate value theorem applies to continuous functions and what it says is if we have a continuous function y equals f of x and on the closed interval from a to b it takes on every value between f of a and f of b. So for all of the values from f of a up to f of b somewhere on the graph the function will pass through each of those values. Another way you could think about this is if y of 0 is between f of a and f of b, then y of 0 equals f of c for some c between a and b. Let's, uh, let's see if we can erase these lines to clean up the drawing for you to copy. So the IVT is often used to prove the existence of a root or zero of a function. And we'll see that in the next example. This example was adapted from an AP question. So this is kind of in the format of an AP question. And the response was constructed in a way that probably would receive full credit on a free, free response. Or at least that was the intention. Given the continuous function f, can it be shown that the function has at least two roots? If we know that f of negative 3 equals 5, f of 1 equals negative 2, f of 6 equals negative 8, and f of 10 equals 4. So let's graph what this looks like. What we have is we have some function and f of negative 3 is 5. We know that f of 1 is negative 2, f of 6, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, f of 6 is negative 8, and f of 10 equals 4. So what we have is some curve which passes through here. Maybe the curve looks like the red curve here, or perhaps it does something more like the blue curve. We don't know exactly what it looks like, but both the curves I drew show that there's at least two roots. Now, this doesn't definitively prove that there's two roots. We actually have to use the IVT, and it's even feasible that there's more than two roots. But with the IVT, we can show that there is at, a, at least two roots. And so we're going to look at the first interval from negative 3 to 1 and since f of x is a continuous function and f of 1 is less than 0 which is less than f of negative 3 and I plugged in those values so we can see it there exists some value c in that interval such that f of c equals 0 so somewhere between negative 3 and 1 we have a value c such that f of c is 0. So that's the intermediate value theorem used to find that there is at least one root in that area. Then we do the same thing and we notice that there's a sign change from f of 6 to f of 10 so there has to be at least one root between f of 6 and f of 10 or between 6 and 10 and we can phrase it the same way since the function is continuous and f of 6 is less than 0 f of 6 is less than 0 is less than f of 10 we know there exists a value between 6 and 10 and we'll call that value d such that f of d equals 0 so there's our D, there's our C. 
The IVT doesn't allow us to figure out where that point occurs, we just know that it occurs. So the function has at least two roots, one at x equals c in the interval from negative 3 to 1, and one at x equals d in the interval from 6 to 10. And for those who are curious how it could have more than two roots, I'll roughly approximate the graph again, what we have here. And we could have a function that goes and does something like that. So there we go. We've got several c's that would create a 0. So we only can prove the existence of at least one c with the IBT. I have a computer graphic that I'm going to show you that walks us through the IVT as well, so that's next. This bird is about to sneeze. Now again, ten times slower. Achoo! Achoo! Apologies. All right, the intermediate value theorem states that if we have a continuous function on the interval AB, and what we have here is a blue curve that we'll call our function, it is continuous on the interval AB. Then for any k between f of a and f of b, there exists some c value within our interval AB such that f of c equals k. So what, let's animate this. So f of a is there, f of b is there, there's our interval for where k could exist in, and if we put our k, we'll say right there, then somewhere between a and b there is a value such that the f of that value equals k. So if I start sweeping c from left to right, we're moving c and we're finding f of c and we get to a point where f of c is equal to k and f of c equals k. So it looks like we actually have three locations where that exists. So right in this location and in this location and in this location. If we reset this and change the equation, then we can see another example of this. So in this example, we have f of a, which is negative, and f of b, which is positive. So we can use the intermediate value theorem to prove that there is at least one zero. So there is at least one occurrence on the graph where this continuous function crosses the x-axis. So we're going to set our f of a is there, our f of b there is there. We have the interval along there from f of a to f of b. And we're going to try to find a k value. There we go, pretty much right there. Our k value is the 0. And somewhere between a and b, there is a c that is equal to it. So as we move along, we keep moving and boom, right there we hit a c that is equal to a function root. And we actually have another root right there. And finally, a third root right there. So the tool that I'm using to demonstrate this is called Calculus in Motion. You can see uh, more of their resources at calculusinmotion.com. All right, thanks for watching the video. After this, you should be able to apply the intermediate value theorem to continuous functions. Uh, this is often used for proving that a function has a root on a given interval or a zero on the given interval. The mathematical term column refers to linear algebra or algebra with matrices, and the column 
is this part of a matrix. So this particular matrix has four columns.